In this video, we are going to look at improper integrals. There are different types of improper integrals. So what I'm going to do is break this into three types and we'll have three different videos, one for each type. This first type is going to be integrals over domain, which is infinite in size, but one of the bounds is a constant and the other one is plus or minus infinity. So we'll look at integrals of this form where you are integrating from some fixed lower bound A to infinity, as well as this form where you're integrating from negative infinity to some fixed number A. What we will do is take that notion of one of the bounds is infinity and replace it with a number t so that we can integrate in the usual way. And then we let t go to infinity. So what we will see is that sometimes when you do that, the integral exists and equals a number. When that happens, we say that the improper integral converges. If it doesn't, because perhaps from A to infinity, the function encloses an infinite amount of area under the curve, then we say that the integral does not exist, or you can say that the integral diverges. Let's start with this example. We would like to integrate 1 over the quantity 2x plus 1 cubed over the domain from 1 to infinity. Now, the thing about Riemann integration is the way that we define it, we have some domain on the x-axis, which until this moment has always been finite. What we do is we subdivide that into subintervals, and then we estimate the notion of area under the curve using rectangular areas. We add those up, we let the number of rectangles go to infinity, and we get to the integral. Here, whenever you say that one of the bounds is infinite, then you can't imagine taking the entire domain from the start and subdividing it into subintervals. Uh, the number of subintervals you create whenever you write down a Riemann sum always needs to be finite in that moment, and then you take a limit. So what we are going to do here is say, we cannot do the definition of Riemann integration the way that we've seen it on the integral as it's written. But what we can say is, and I'm going to write limit first, but I want to talk about this in a second. Let's take that top bound of infinity and replace it with a number which in the moment is fixed, and then we'll let it go to infinity. So that's going to look like, for this example, integrating from 1 to t, 1 over 2x plus 1 cubed dx. Here's what we've done, is we've taken a domain which was infinite in length from the start, and we're saying, first, integrate this expression, where t, you want to think of it as like a fixed quantity. Does this integral exist for any such given t? And then what happens if we let t go larger and larger? Does the integral continue to exist? Does it tend to something? If it does, then that's how we'll define the integral from 1 to infinity. So with this integral the way it's written, if t is a fixed number, this is a real Riemann integral the way that we've always done it. Okay, so let's keep going. Don't want to go off on too many tangents. Let me keep writing limit as t goes to infinity. You want to keep this around until you actually take the limit. Here, I will, just for this first example, rewrite this one more time. Let's go from 1 to t, 2x plus 1 to the negative 3, so that you can really see the power rule there. I can anti-differentiate this right away. So we'll say that this is the limit as t goes to infinity of... We write it first with the power rule part. So 2x plus 1 to the negative 2. I'm not done with the antiderivative. If I differentiate this, a negative 2 would drop down. And also, I would pick up a 2 from differentiating the inside using the chain rule. So I would have a total of negative 4. So I need to multiply out in front by negative 1 fourth to cancel that out. OK, so all that to say that this is anti has an antiderivative of negative 1 fourth times 2x plus 1 to the negative 2. This is a definite integral where we're going to plug in 1 and t, this top bound of t. When we do that, leave the limit out front. Taking the limit comes at the very end. So I'm going to do the definite um, integral computation in here. So we'll have negative 1 fourth. 2t plus 1 to the negative 2. I'm going to go ahead and write that back as a rational function. So how about 2t plus 1 squared, like that, minus negative 1 fourth, so plus 1 fourth times 1 over 2 times 1 plus 1 is 3, 3 squared. Okay, pause and take a look at that. We're ready now to evaluate the limit. As t gets larger and larger, 
this rational function here looks like one over increasingly large numbers. This is going to go to zero, which means that in the limit as t goes to infinity, we're going to be left with an expression that looks like zero plus one fourth times one over nine. So overall, this is zero plus one over 36. So that means that this improper integral converges. This integral that we started with, this exists. It equals the real number one over 36. Conceptually, what you can imagine is that if you were to graph this function over the domain from one to infinity, so just imagine taking some large domain and looking at the graph of this function, the area along the domain appears to go on forever, but we're saying it adds up to a total of one over 36 units of area. So although our domain is infinite, the area is finite. For our second example, some aspects of it are similar to the first one. We are integrating over a domain that starts at a fixed number, in this case, zero, and goes off to infinity. But this time, the result is going to be a little bit different. So let's see what happens here. We are trying to integrate from zero to infinity the function one over the fourth root of one plus x. The first step is going to be the same. What we want to do is take this improper integral and rewrite it as the limit of a regular looking integral where the top bound is some number t. So I'll say the limit as t goes to infinity from zero to t. How about we go ahead and switch it into kind of a power rule form. So this is one plus x to the negative one fourth dx. Now we just need to anti-differentiate. Leave the limit in front until you take it. So limit as t goes to infinity of one plus x Add one to that, you get three fourths. Now, if I differentiate this, the three fourths would come down. So I need to multiply by four thirds to cancel that out. We have a definite integral from zero to t. Okay, let's see what happens here. What I'm going to do is plug in the top bound, subtract off plugging in the bottom bound. So that's going to look like the limit as t goes to infinity of four thirds. I'm going to take this rational exponent here and convert it into an exponent in root form. So this is equivalent to the fourth root of one plus t cubed. Okay, so this is one plus t to the three fourths minus four thirds, uh, one plus zero to the three fourths, which is one. Okay, I'm gonna give you a second to analyze what's happening here. So we're ready to take the limit. What happens to this expression as t gets larger and larger? So what happens if we take the limit as t goes to infinity? What happens as t goes to infinity is the quantity one plus t cubed gets larger and larger. We take the fourth root of it, and as t goes to infinity, this expression is going to go to infinity. So this first part, blows up to infinity, basically. The second part is minus four thirds, but that doesn't matter. Overall, the limit of this expression as t goes to infinity does not exist as a, a, a real number, right? So your limit only exists when it equals a finite real number. So what we're going to say is that this does not exist. Another way to say that is that this indefinite integral, or sorry, this improper integral, got my terminology mixed up, it diverges. That's a way of saying that if you look at the graph of this function from zero to infinity, the domain goes on forever. And as we travel left to right along the x-axis, this function is not enclosing a finite amount of area, unlike the previous example. So the area under this function from zero to infinity is an infinite amount of area. Let's look at this improper integral, which is the integral from one to infinity of one over x dx. This is part one of a two part problem because what we're going to do is take one over x in a second, and we're going to look at similar expressions of the form one over x to the p. So we're gonna isolate this case first, and then we'll generalize it and make a statement about expressions that look like this in part two. So what we have here is the area enclosed between the x-axis and part of the hyperbola y equals one over x from one to infinity. Our question is, is this a finite amount of area or is it infinite? So what we need to do is first write 
let's take this infinite upper bound and replace it with t. Then we'll take t to infinity. So we'll write limit as t goes to infinity from 1 to t, 1 over x dx. This is not going to be a very long computation because this has an antiderivative of natural log. So we'll have the limit as t goes to infinity of natural log of, you could write absolute value of x, but every x in this domain is positive. So I'm just going to write natural log of x like that. Now let's plug in our bounds and we get the limit as t goes to infinity of the natural log of t minus the natural log of one. Okay, take a look at that. Here's what we find with this improper integral. As t goes to infinity, natural log of t goes to infinity. So natural log just grows larger and larger. Natural log of one is zero. So overall, the limit of this expression as t goes to infinity goes to infinity. So what you could say is this limit does not exist. I write D and E for that does not exist. It does not exist in equal a finite number. In other words, this improper integral diverges. What we are going to do now is take a very similar looking expression, except it's going to be one over x to the p. And what we want to figure out is for what exponents there does the improper integral converge versus diverge? This particular case that we've just analyzed is the case p equals one. So we will not consider that case. We'll consider every other possible value of p. As promised, we now want to look at the improper integral of one over x to the p from one to infinity. Here, p will not be one because we just did the case p equals one a second ago when we anti-differentiated with the natural log function. That's a special antiderivative. Every other possible exponent p is going to have the same style anti-differentiation. So let's go ahead and say that this is going to be equal to the limit as t goes to infinity from one to t of x to the negative p dx. Again, if p is not equal to 1, this is power rule. When p does equal 1, it's natural log. That's why we had to do that case separately. So with the power rule, we'll get that this is the limit as t goes to infinity of, let's see, we're going to take x to the negative p and add 1 to it, to that exponent. So I'll write 1 minus p. And then if I were to differentiate that, this would come down. So I need to scale that in front by 1 over 1 minus p. Notice p can't be equal to 1 there, else you'd have 0 in the denominator and then we'll plug in the bounds one and t. Okay, let's go ahead and do that and then I'll give you a chance to think about what we can say in terms of p. So this is the limit as t goes to infinity of one over one minus p, t to the one minus p, minus when I plug one in for x, we'll just get one to the one minus p, that's going to be one, so minus, 1 over 1 minus p. Okay, what we have here is uh, an expression with t being raised to a power. So you want to think about what kind of exponents you could have here based on p and then how that would affect the limit. So what happens if p is, say, bigger than 1, less than 1? What would happen to this limit? So see if you can make a conjecture, come to the conclusion on your own for, for a minute, and then I'll come back and finish this computation. If I were seeing this for the first time, here's how I would think about it. It appears that p equals one is some kind of cutoff. So let me just test a value of p which is larger than one and a value of p which is less than one and see what kind of generalized conclusions I might make from my experiment. So what if p were greater than one, say p is two? Then this would be t to the one minus two, which is t to the negative one. That's one over t. As t goes to infinity, 1 over t goes to 0. Now think about other values of p which would be bigger than 1. Would they have the same behavior? And the answer is going to be yes, because any value of p which is bigger than 1 is going to make this exponent 1 minus p negative the way it's written. So we could flip it to the denominator of a rational function where as t goes to infinity, the denominator would get really large and overall the expression would go to zero. 
So the conclusion, if P is greater than one, then T to the one minus P goes to zero. Okay. What happens if P is less than one? So let's try P equals zero. There's like test one, test two. If P is zero, then T to the one minus P is T to the one. Sorry, <laughs> wrote that a little strangely. T to the one minus P is T to the one. It's not having the property where it flips to denominator, if you will. So as t goes to infinity, this expression is going to go to infinity. And that would happen for any p-value less than 1. 1 minus p in that case would be positive. So we wouldn't do this flipping action. We'd be left with a number being exponentiated, which is getting increasingly large. So those limits would go to infinity. So let's kind of kick those out. Just consider p greater than 1. Then when we take the limit as t goes to infinity and p is greater than one, this whole expression would go to zero. We would be left with negative one over one minus p, which if you wanted to, you could bring that negative into the denominator and write this perhaps a little more cleanly as p minus one. Notice if p is larger than one, this is a positive number. We're enclosing some finite positive amount of area under the curve. So overall, our conclusion is that this integral is convergent if and only if p is greater than 1. This example has a slight variation from the previous examples, but overall the setup and process is going to be essentially the same. So what we're looking at here is an improper integral because the lower bound is negative infinity. So in this case, we're looking down essentially the left half of the x-axis, if you will. We're going to do the same process. So we will take this improper integral and write it as the limit as t goes to negative infinity this time of the definite integral from t to zero e to the 3x dx. Same idea, take the bound which goes to infinity, replace it with t, in this case it's just negative infinity. We need to anti-differentiate, plug in our bounds and compute this limit. So this is going to be the limit as t goes to negative infinity of e to the 3x times 1 third. Our bounds are t and 0. Plug in our constant top bound of 0 first and we'll have the limit as t goes to negative infinity of one third times e to the zero. Overall, that's going to be one third minus one third e to the three t. Take a look at that. What happens here is that e to the three t is going to essentially e to the negative infinity, if you will. So t is going to negative infinity. So this overall exponent that we're raising e to is going to negative infinity. That means we're looking down like the decay side of the exponential function. e goes to 0 as 3t goes to negative infinity. So this part is going to go to 0, and we're left with just 1 third. So that means that the area we're enclosing between the, the x-axis and the graph of y equals e to the 3x from negative infinity up to zero, it exists and it's a finite number. The amount of area is one third. So this integral converges.